Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's session on managing your online reputation and the social media rules of engagement. Joining, to, joining me today is Dr. Kevin Poe, um, a board-certified uh, internal medicine physician, uh, blogger and social media expert, and the co-author of Establishing and Managing, Establishing, Managing, Protecting, and Protecting Your Online Reputation, a social media guide for physicians and medical practices. He's most commonly known as the founder and editor of KevinMD.com, the predominant social media platform in the healthcare industry with over 1 million monthly page views and over 100,000 subscribers worldwide. His dual role as a practicing physician and a healthcare social media leader contribute to his unique perspective on navigating social media in the healthcare industry. He recently published his book in February 2013 called, uh, titled Establishing, Managing, and Protecting Your Online Reputation, a Social Media Guide for Physicians and Medical Practices. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Ke uh, Dr. Kevin Poe, and thank you for joining us today, Kevin. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Great. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. I'm looking forward to this. Wonderful, wonderful. So, with the, when you were writing your book, what was your uh, what was the goal in mind that you had for healthcare providers? Well, whenever I talked to doctors, one of the biggest concerns they had was they were having new patients find them on the internet, and it wasn't through their website necessarily, but it was through online physician rating sites. And this is a topic that doctors are really scared of because one of the things that they are worried about are bad online reviews or negative comments or even the competition writing negative comments about them. So I wanted to share some of my knowledge that I've garnered over the years uh, on social media and let doctors know that there is a way to control how they appear online and it's through various social media entities, whether it's through a blog, LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook. And I know a lot of doctors are busy and they don't have time for this, but there are simple ways where they can utilize these social media tools, and by doing so, they get a what's called a digital footprint, a presence on Google. So when patients Google them, it won't necessarily be a physician rating site that comes up, but it could be information that they can control through various social media profiles. And as more and more patients go online to look for their doctor, doctors need to know how to manage their online presence and I wanted to distill everything I, I, I knew in a single volume, and that's how the book came about. So how, why, why, how would a doctor who's already uh, very busy usually managing a practice and, and seeing many uh, patients per day really find the time to use social media to establish their online reputation, really uh, build a name for themselves? Well, I understand a lot of doctors are busy. I'm a practicing primary care physician myself. I see about 20 to 25 patients a day. And I understand that doctors may not have a lot of time for social media. And I certainly don't advocate that doctors use social media to the extent I do. But just the simple act of going on LinkedIn, for instance, and building a profile there, and a LinkedIn profile is a digital translation of your resume, that in itself is a pretty powerful act because LinkedIn profiles specifically, more so than other social media platforms, they get ranked high when your name is Googled. And what that does, it pushes down the effect of information that you don't control. And that information can be from a physician rating site or can even could be from a negative news story. And if that's all you have time for, that's great. Because that 45 minutes of time that you spent building that LinkedIn profile, that would already put you ahead of the majority of your peers. But if you have more time and you want to engage further in social media, start a blog, um, start a presence on Facebook or Twitter, that's only going to be to your benefit because what that does, it's going to expand that digital footprint and further put you in control of how you appear when your name is Google. Excellent. Yeah, it's, it's definitely extremely important to get your, get your name out there and, and make it easy for you to find. And, and I've definitely experienced that, that getting your name on, onto LinkedIn is a really, really great way to start. Um, so it, in, in short, what would be the main takeaway that, you, that, that you're trying to, to uh, instill into the reader with, uh, with your book? 
Well, there's a, there's a couple main takeaways. The first main takeaway is that everybody in healthcare, they need to Google themselves at least once a week because that's what patients are doing. Almost half of patients in the United States on the Internet, they're not just going online to look for information about their diagnosis and treatment options. They're going online to research their doctors. They're not going through word of mouth anymore or through the yellow pages or through the newspaper. They're going on Google. So it's tremendously important that doctors are, are aware of how they appear on Google. And the second takeaway is what I briefly alluded to before, is that doctors uh, have ways to take control of their online reputation. I always uh, say that doctors need to proactively define themselves online rather than having other entities, whether it's a, a newspaper or a physician rating site, having these other entities define them. And now that we have so many powerful tools at our disposal, we can, we can do a great job of defining ourselves online. Absolutely. Absolutely. So where can the listeners get their hands on a copy? Is it available on, on uh, Amazon, Amazon, on Kindle, or anything like that? It's available on Amazon, so certainly you can uh, search for uh, establishing, managing, and protecting your online reputation. You can also go to my website at kevinmd.com, and you go to my publisher's website at greenbranch, G-R-E-E-N-B-R-A-N-C-H, greenbranch.com slash reputation, and you should be able to find it on any of those sites. Excellent, excellent. We got we have a, a couple copies in the uh, in the office. I'm trying to get trying to get everyone to to take a look at them. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. So, uh, by now, a lot of most healthcare stakeholders, and especially stakeholders in the medical tourism industry, understand that they should have a presence on social media. But many don't really know where to start, and it seems like uh, many of them just need want to get out get out there and, and onto social media. Like like you were mentioning about about uh, getting your your name on LinkedIn. Um, but a lot of uh, I found that a lot of them believe that they should sign up on every single social network and, and, and try and get their name everywhere at once. Now, do you agree with this or is there a method to the madness? I think there is a method. And first, you need to define what you want to do on social media. What are your goals? Because social media can be used for so many different applications. Do you want to educate the public? Do you want to share behind-the-scenes stories? Do you want to find new patients? Do you want to engage in healthcare policy and advocate change? Or do you just want to use it to establish an online reputation? So based on the answers to these questions, there are going to be some platforms that are better for you than others. For instance, if you just want to share information, I think Twitter is a great pr uh, platform because you can use Twitter to uh, share uh, articles from your own website or articles from reputable sources of health information. If you want to reach a younger demographic, you may want a presence on, on Facebook. There is a uh, practice in Texas, uh, MacArthur OBGYN, and this is a, uh, obviously an OBGYN practice, and I was talking to one of the gynecologists, and they have a prominent Facebook practice. And this gynecologist was saying that having a Facebook page allowed his group to connect with a demographic who ordinarily would be a little bit apprehensive about going to the gynecologist, teenagers. And he was talking to one of his teenage patients, and she said how cool it was that her doctor's practice was on Facebook, and that was the only reason why she read patient education materials on STDs and teenage pregnancies. And um, if, you want, if your goal is to write longer articles, then you may, may want to... Uh, start a blog, for instance. So if there were one social network that I would recommend, I think I talked about it earlier, it probably would be LinkedIn because that has the most impact in terms of getting your name out there. But if you want to expand your digital footprint, it will certainly depend on what your goals are for social media. So you really need to think about what you hope to accomplish by being online. Absolutely. So a lot, another point that, I, that I've come across is that um, a lot of people seem to have a, a type of social media anxiety when it comes to engagement online, uh, especially since they understand that the only way to really push themselves, and especially in a in a business-to-business -business environment like like LinkedIn, is to have a one-on-one -on -one personal uh, uh, engagement with their connections and 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 potentially get them on the phone in order to create uh, new business deals. But of course, with social media anxiety, a lot of them could. It, it kind of freezes them up, keeps them from, from uh, messaging people. So what would be some of the tips that you have for overcoming social media anxiety? Well, doctors in general, they're going to have different comfort levels as to being online. There's going to be some doctors 
uh, who are very comfortable. They've grown up on social media, whether it's through MySpace and Facebook, and they're very comfortable being online, sharing articles, sharing pictures, sharing uh, what they're doing, sharing videos. And there are going to be uh, doctors on the other side of the spectrum where just being online, they're going to be very frightened, apprehensive. And what you want to do is you don't want to pigeonhole all doctors in a certain box. I think you need to uh, adjust to each individual doctor's comfort level when it comes to being online and encourage them to go at their own pace. So my advice would be to start slow. You want to first be comfortable even being online. So you could tiptoe in and just get that LinkedIn profile, and you could even stop there and just be comfortable uh, being Google and, and being found on Google. And once you are comfortable with that, then you can take the next step, which would be lurking or listening. And I would recommend going on Twitter and following various medical thought leaders on Twitter, listening to what they have to say and, and reading the articles that they share. And once you reach that stage and, comfort, and are comfortable with that, you can then start sharing stories of your own and increase your engagement and even write short pieces on Facebook posts uh, or even start a blog and start writing longer pieces or even make a video on YouTube to share. But each individual doctor has, has, has his own comfort level. Uh, we need to respect that and, and encourage doctors to, to adopt social media at his own individual pace. Absolutely. You always got, but I always, I always uh, believe that the first step is always the hardest step, and, and after that, it, it, it always gets a lot easier, and you get far, far more comfortable with what you're doing the further you, and, and, and deeper you get into what you're doing. No, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's really that first step that I find a lot of doctors hesitant to make, and once uh, they're, they're used to being comfortable online, I think uh, uh, you're right, the, 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 the rate at which they will uh, adopt social media grows exponentially. Absolutely. So, once once you do take that first step and, and you start really engaging with people, uh, some people get get a little bit little uh, courageous online and and they they lose sight of what what actually is engaging with someone, and it really turns into a, 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 a so they turn social media into a large uh, billboard for them, uh, so to speak. So. In your, in your opinion, what, what is the difference between engagement and advertisement in social media, and, and how, do you, how do you try to promote engagement through your channel? Well, the difference between advertisement and engagement is really the difference between one-way versus two-way communication. With uh, advertising, it's really just information consumption, where information goes from the advertiser to the audience, whereas engagement is more facilitating discussion, two-way conversation, between the author and the audience. And with my various platforms on KevinMD.com, I, I do a little bit of both. So there's a balance between syndicating my posts, which is one-way communication that I do on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. And I think there's a role for that, because not everyone goes to my site to read the articles. They may consume information only on one of the other social networks. Uh, and then you have to balance that with also engaging my community, and that's with the comments and the discussion that follows each post. Uh, sometimes people say that the comments are even more interesting than the post itself, and that's certainly true because in healthcare there are so many art, uh, so many topics that are controversial and and are, simply aren't black and white. And people can also engage in comments on uh, when the post is syndicated on Facebook, and it's another outpost for them to converse. So I do a little bit of both. I do a little bit of syndication, which is one-way communication, and I balance that by facilitating conversation that occurs both in the comments and also sometimes on Twitter and Facebook. Absolutely, yes. Comment feeds can definitely definitely get pretty exciting and a little bit hairy at the, at, at the same time, uh, seeing a, especially uh, seeing it go on, on a few of the, few of the uh, uh, especially on LinkedIn and whatnot, I've seen, I've seen it go in many different directions. But uh, it's it's definitely a great way to really be able to to see what the community is looking at, at least from from a, a social media management uh, perspective. Really see what your listeners' opinion is, and 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 kind of engage or uh, gauge your content uh, based off off of that and for uh, future posts. Absolutely, and that two-way communication really is the defining feature of social media. Whereas before on the web, people would just have that one-way communication, the, the advertising. And it's really that two-way conversation, that, that social media strength. And, and I'd like to see more of us in healthcare try to utilize that 
break down those healthcare walls and bridge that gap between patient and provider. Absolutely, and definitely helping each other out and, and, and pushing for a positive impact and, and, and help, us, help us be the best that we can be. <laughs> so, and also, I mean, a lot of, uh, since consistently advertising could kind of hurt you and, and you have to have that balance between engagement and advertisement, um, and consistently advertising can really hurt your, your, your uh, company's uh, reputation and cause you to lose a lot of uh, followers and, and have a lot of your uh, listeners turn, turn the proverb, proverbial deaf ear to you. Um, what content do you like to, to uh, push out and topics that do you like to write about that, that you believe will build a relationship with your reader and, and uh, build like a, a really strong level of trust with them to see you as a leader? Well, the most powerful way to build trust is through transparency and reveal something to the audience that they don't uh, know about about you. And I think with social media, it, there are great ways to, to be transparent, and especially with healthcare in the United States. Uh, there is a lack of healthcare transparency, and social media can, again, break down those walls. So there are two stories that I want to share that really highlight the transparency that social media gives. The first story I want to talk about is the former CEO of Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. His name is Paul Levy, and this is a hospital in Boston. And when he was CEO there, he had a hospital blog. And he would talk about things most hospitals don't talk about, like the infection rates in the intensive care unit, as well as medical mistakes that his staff made. And he famously told a story of a patient going to his hospital for foot surgery. And when this patient woke up in the recovery room, he looked at the bandages on his foot and then asked the doctor beside him, doctor, why are the bandages on my left foot instead of my right foot? And the doctor realized at that moment he had operated on the wrong side. And when Paul heard about this, the hospital CEO, he didn't get angry. He didn't punish the doctor. He wrote about it on his blog because he believed that real-time public disclosure can be mutually instructive, meaning he didn't just want his hospital staff and his hospital to learn from the mistake. He wanted others to learn from it as well. And he believed that transparency was a powerful way to improve patient safety. And, of course, what could be more transparent and what could build trust more than a hospital CEO openly blogging about a medical mistake in his hospital? The second story I want to talk about is uh, a company that I'm sure everybody around the world knows. It's, about, it's, it's McDonald's, the fast food company. And there was a survey from the PR firm Edelman where they found that McDonald's had about the same trust level uh, when compared to healthcare institutions. So up in Canada, McDonald's had a campaign. It was called Our Food, Your Questions, where they would use social media to solicit questions from the public and had high-level executives answer them on YouTube. And one of the questions was this, why does your food look so much better in pictures than it does in real life? So one of the executives brought viewers back on a YouTube video behind the scenes to a hamburger photo shoot and revealed it took about four to five hours to create the perfect burger. It was made by a team of food stylists. And after we took the pictures, it was Photoshopped to remove any imperfections. So this video on YouTube, it went viral because no one knew this is what they did. No one, McDonald's never gave that type of transparency before. And the ratio of likes to dislikes on that YouTube video was about four to one. And this is for a company like McDonald's, which is uh, pretty uh, heavily vilified in the United States. So the bottom line from these two examples is that transparency uh, is really the, con the type of content that would resonate the most. And if you're transparent, you can certainly build trust with your audience. And that's especially true in healthcare, where transparency hasn't been the norm traditionally. And the thing about social media, it gives you a great stage to share those stories and highlight your transparency. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I, I, from from my experience in the in the hospitality industry, I've definitely seen a lot of uh, the the, uh, the different ways that they that they present uh, those food photo shoots. It's funny that you that you brought that up. <laughs> a lot of the times, it's it's uh, they don't actually cook it to make the hamburgers look larger. <laughs> so, 
since many companies that are, are already pre uh, present on social media or manage a blog and, and really really are, are there promoting themselves or if you're a, if you're a new company that that is just getting started on social media and you see all of these big players out out in the field and uh, your you, your message really isn't getting across to, to, to a real big group of followers um, how, how how would you suggest someone to, to, to stand out from the noise and, and really like become a leader in social media or at least get people to listen to what they have to say so in order to uh, connect with the audience, you need to do so on a personal level. And to connect on a personal level, you need to be able to tell stories. They've done studies on the power of telling stories. And stories can overcome preconceived biases. And by far, they resonate more than numbers, data, and statistics. So one of the po most powerful ways hospitals could use social media, and especially hospitals in the medical tourism industry, is to share patient stories, share stories of, of your successes. And that's what uh, hospitals like the Mayo Clinic does in the United States. They, they have a fantastic social media presence, and they use that platform to share patient stories that come from their hospital. So you want to showcase patients uh, through stories, whether it's a video like YouTube or on a, on a blog post. You can also use social media in novel ways to connect with patients. Mayo Clinic, uh, a few years ago, they hosted a Twitter chat where they made one of their orthopedic surgeons available for, uh, for a chat with the public. And there was one patient, and she, she had been having wrist pain for years and participated in this Twitter chat with the uh, Mayo Clinic surgeon, got to answer, uh, ask him a few questions and describe her condition to him, and he suggested that she seek another opinion. But because of the trust that was built up in that Twitter chat, she actually made an appointment at the Mayo Clinic, traveled there to see this doctor personally. And he evaluated her, uh, performed an operation on her wrist, and, and, and solved, her, solved her problem. And this was a pretty profound example of a patient connecting with a hospital through social media like Twitter. And that hadn't been done, done before social media was invented. And now we have hospitals using social media like I said, in novel ways. A couple years ago, there was a hospital in Houston that broadcast live on Twitter open heart surgery. And I'm certainly not saying that we need to broadcast every surgery on the web. This was a unique case where the hospital and doctors were motivated and the patient agreed to have his surgery broadcast. But again, what that did, it brought patients and doctors closer together where the doctors had the opportunity to answer patient questions on open heart surgery, pull that curtain back, and demystify the procedure. And now we have tools like Google Glass where, where doctors are wearing glasses made by Google where that can stream whatever uh, is seen through those glasses on the Internet. And again, we're very early in this. What that does, it helps in terms of medical education. Residents and medical students can, can see what the doctor is seeing, and the doctor can even talk to consultants and view images without leaving the surgical field. And this type of transparency was unheard of before the advent of real-time social media. So those are my two take-homes in terms of how to separate your content, to place your content above the rest. You want to connect on a personal level with stories, and you want to push the envelope with social media. Use it in novel ways um, that other medical institutions may not have yet. Absolutely, you got to think about think outside the box in order to really get uh, to to be progressive. And speaking of speaking of, of uh, engaging patients online, um, as you know, medical tourism is primarily driven by by the internet, and most of the, the stakeholders are actively searching for healthcare consumers online. What what social platform do you see the most engagement uh, from from patients or in, in in terms of medical tourism the consumers? Where do you see most of them uh, coming from? Well, they're probably going to come mostly from Google and and web searches. So what that means is there is a need to diversify. Um, there isn't one specific social media channel that's better than the rest. Uh, if you want a large Google footprint, you need to diversify your social media presence. So you need a presence not only on the website, but also on, on Twitter, through uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+. Because patients, they consume information on different platforms. So 
one patient may not read what you put on your blog, but may see what you, what you, what you uh, post on, on Facebook or LinkedIn. And by engaging in more social media platforms, that's just going to make your Google footprint even bigger and increase the chance that patients will find you online. Every social media platform should link back to your central hub. Uh, for me, that hub will be my blog, but for a, a, a hospital, for instance, it could be their website. And it's their website where they can close the transaction with potential patients. Yeah, and we definitely, I've definitely, you see a lot of information online about the the spoken or the hub and spoke uh, tactic on, on social media, and it's it's definitely one of the only ways to really uh, to 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 push traffic and, and create an ROI using social media. Absolutely. So with with. Uh, like HIPAA and, and patient protection in, in, in mind, what, what would you say are, are the risks for, for communicating with, with patients online? How, how do you engage healthcare consumers in a safe way that, that, doesn't, that doesn't risk any uh, issues through, through HIPAA law or uh, any other patient privacy law? Well, my rule of thumb is that social media is a great way to speak to patients collectively, but not yet individually. And uh, HIPAA, the federal privacy law in the United States, of course needs to be the minimum standard. And on social networks, medical professionals need to aim above that. And they may sound like common sense, but there was a study showing that 90% of American state medical boards have received complaints that doctors are unprofessional online. So there's a simple rule of thumb I use whenever anyone is on a social network. We need to imagine ourselves in a crowded hospital elevator and Whatever we write on a social network needs to be appropriate if we say it aloud in that elevator. And that rule of thumb, as well as keeping in mind that social media is really used to speak to patients collectively, should keep the majority of health professionals out of trouble. Um, and uh, I, I recommend that rule to all the doctors I talk to. And, and you see the, you know, the news stories of doctors getting fired because of inappropriate social media. It's because they, they, they break that rule. So what, if, a, if a patient was, was getting to the point where it's, where it's a little worrisome, of course you don't want to say, don't talk to me on social media, but how would you really handle uh, like a patient looking for an inquiry or, or asking a, a specific message that, that would violate an, uh, one of these laws or just violate uh, any any uh, uh, best practice that you would have. Yeah, but as your digital footprint grows, of course, there's going to be a greater chance that strangers are going to uh, contact you and solicit you for medical information. So in doing research for my book, I talked to a lot of privacy experts and lawyers, and they said that the only legally sound way is to uh, do the following. You want to take that conversation offline with a standard reply, and that reply should have the following elements. Number one, I do not give personal medical advice on the web. Number two, if you want to call my office, please call this number. And number three, if this is an emergency, go to the emergency room or call 911. You uh, don't want to reply on a social network. You don't want to reply in a public forum. Um, you want to do your best to take that conversation offline, and then you could give those general instructions. Absolutely. So sometimes mistakes happen. Uh, a patient might might be upset with with uh, with the level of service that was that was given, or maybe you didn't you didn't give them a call back. It could be anything from big to small. How how do you overcome negative reputations from from a word of mouth or an on, online response, maybe on Angie's on an, Angie's list or uh, another review site? Sure. This is uh, the most common questions I get asked when I talk about online reputation. Is how do you uh, how do you respond to online criticism? Because there's so many ways now for patients to express displeasure online, whether it's through social media or through one of these physician rating sites. So there are a couple of things I recommend. Number one is we got to listen to them because a lot of times when patients leave this type of online feedback, it's the only way they can generate any type of, of, of feedback because once a patient leaves my exam room, I don't know what they thought about their visit. I don't know what they thought about me, the nurses, whether there was enough parking or whether the magazines were up to date. So all of these matter into the patient experience, and some of these are correctable issues. And the only way that you would know about them is 
through a uh, online criticism. So listen to them and see if there's anything that you can correct. The second thing is is related to what I had spoken about earlier. You there's a temptation to respond to it immediately online, and and my advice is, is don't. You want to take that conversation offline, so you could again post the standard reply thanking that patient for his comment and asking to call the office. And perhaps you can resolve that dispute in person or over the phone. And if that dispute is resolved successfully, that patient may take down his comment or even amend it and say, hey, this office is listening to what I have to say. And that can turn a negative situation into a potentially more constructive one. Number three, we got to stay out of the courts. Don't sue. I'm aware of very few lawsuits that where a doctor or hospital successfully sued one of these rating sites to bring down a negative rating. And there have been stories about doctors suing patients for negative reviews. And, and again, that is going to cause more harm than it's going to help because there's something that's what's known as, as the Streisand effect. Yeah, back in the 1980s, Barbara Streisand sued a group of photographers for taking pictures of her Malibu home. And one of the unintended consequences that it brought more attention to those pictures. So you have these stories where doctors are suing patients, and that's just going to bring more attention to that criticism. And not only that, Google is going to, is going to index these stories. So whenever a patient Googles a doctor's name, it's not necessarily uh, a profile that comes up or social media presence. It's going to be the story where the doctor sued the patient. And that's not the best online first impression. So uh, you want to avoid the courts. So Absolutely. number uh, four, what can we do instead? I think that we can ask actually more patients to rate us online. And that may sound paradoxical, but there have been a couple of studies that show that the majority of physician ratings are better than a lot of doctors would think. Up to 90% of uh, online physician ratings are positive. And if you ask more patients to rate you, it's going to make negative ratings look like outliers and potentially uh, and drown them out. So, so ask more patients to rate you, and I think that's going to increase the ratio of positive to negative ratings. And um, lastly, we can use social media to control that, uh, uh, control how we look online. Because if we have a strong social media presence and if we control our digital footprint, Criticism online is going to be pushed down, so when patients Google you, that criticism won't show up as high on a Google search. Mm -hmm. I've actually, I actually got a question from someone re regarding the subject. Um, they, they're having, they, they have problems with, uh, with a competitor that, that seems to constantly be uh, quote unquote trolling them, um, they, and they don't really know what, what to do. Uh, it's, they're sending messages that they said that the, they're consistently posting messages trying to hurt their reputation. Do you feel like they should address it, or, or I mean, or should they do the take it take the the message uh, offline and address it privately, or how 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 would you go about taking care of someone who is who is consistently trying to put you down? Yeah. So I assume that this is through some type of uh, of health rating site where competitors are are, are putting false uh, patient ratings uh, on a site. Uh, I think that. Um, certainly, you could launch a complaint with the uh, site itself because if the competitor is, is is fraudulently posting patient reviews, that goes against the terms of agreement. So certainly, that's that's one one area that they can do. And the second is is certainly you could make them less relevant by creating content about yourself that would rank higher than the the criticism on that site. So again, if you have a strong social media presence, whether it's through LinkedIn or if you're big enough, you could have a Wikipedia entry. These are the, this is the type of content that would, would tend to get ranked high and push down some of this criticism. You want to maximize the information that you control and put that up top. So information that you don't control, such as being slandered online by a competitor, that gets pushed down in terms of relevancy, possibly to the second page. So to sum up, I would contact the site owners and let them know that they have potentially fraudulent reviews from a competitor who's making up uh, uh, you know, making up comments, and secondly, I would increase your resources and make proactive content that could push down some of these uh, some of these comments. And what would be your opinion if it was on a like a Facebook page that you own or or a, a LinkedIn group that you're that you're a member of? 
where you might have the, the ability to delete the comment or delete the user. Do you believe that it's best to just push them away, or is, do you think is there a, is there a way to uh, to go about that that's not as abrasive? Yeah. So I think that this is this goes to a larger issue of public comments, and this is an issue that I that I uh, deal with uh, on my own site. I think that any type of social media presence um, that you own, you should be you should have the right to uh, moderate the comments. So um, in the United States, of course, everyone says the First Amendment of free speech. And the First Amendment really gives you the freedom of expression to write on your own blog, but not my blog. So I have a pretty strong terms of agreement that if anyone violates uh, any my, you know, my sense of decorum, if they're hostile, if they're offensive, they use vulgar language, if they personally attack me, or, or if they're not civil in any way, I simply delete the comment. So if you have a social media presence like Facebook, and uh, someone writes something that violates your terms of agreement, uh, by all means, it's, it's your Facebook page, and you should have the right to moderate comments to keep the discussion civil. Absolutely. I definitely believe that it's a, it would be an important thing for a lot of uh, uh, group managers or, or form owners to, to adopt it, a really strong uh, terms of use uh, policy. So. To get down to the to your to your core uh, best practices, what what are your your primary do's and do's not do nots uh, while engaging on social media, and primarily a business to business uh, setting, and also a, a business to consumer setting uh, that these, that the listeners can take away today. Yeah, so I think it's really something that I've mentioned in um, uh, pre my previous answers, but I want to sum it up here. So here's a don't: you don't want to give personal medical advice. You you want to speak to patients collectively but not individually. I think there's certainly malpractice issues and by communicating with a patient that you don't necessarily know on social media that doesn't uh, construe a, a doctor-patient relationship and you could get in trouble because you haven't, uh, you don't know that patient and you haven't examined that patient. So by, by, by giving uh, medical advice on a more collective basis that, that will keep you out of trouble. Uh, what you do want to do is, of course, stay professional, and I talked about the elevator test. I think one other thing I mentioned, I want to mention is that what you write on the web is written in ink. Whenever you post a blog, for instance, it gets indexed by Google and can always be looked up in the archives, even after you delete the post. So you really have to think twice before, before uh, hitting the enter key and posting uh, content on social media. Um, and once you do, consider it written in ink. And um, my last do is that we want to spread reputable health information by acting as filters. And this is something I want to touch upon. Uh, there was a recent study earlier this year that found that about 72% of Internet users use the web to look for uh, health information. But uh, as we know, not all the information is reputable. And I think that we in healthcare, we have a responsibility to act as filters, to filter out some of this health information so patients uh, only get what's reputable. And uh, one area that in the United States is, is controversial is, is the vaccine autism debate. Because if you Google vaccines and autism, there's a lot of, of, of people who, who say that there is a link when, there, when all the scientific evidence says otherwise. And one thing that we can do as health professionals is that we can post reputable content that debunks this myth. There are about 60,000 pediatricians in this country and Brian Vardabedian, he's a pediatric gastroenterologist and one of my fellow uh, physician social media leaders. And he says that if every one of these pediatricians wrote just one blog post a year talking about vaccines and autism, just think about how that flood of reputable information can drown out the online presence of, of those who spread misinformation. So any, uh, uh, any one of us in healthcare, we do have that responsibility to generate not only content that's related to what we do, but just content that can help patients. Because we need to improve the ratio of reliable health information online, and social media is just a tremendous way to do so. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's definitely, it definitely was a pleasure ha having you uh, answer some of our questions that we that we had that that we really feel that are, are would be imp important for the uh, for the for uh, our listeners and and our uh, the stakeholders in the industry. And of course, I would like to thank everyone who came onto the call today. Um, Kevin, uh, Dr. Kevin Poe will be at our conference in Las Vegas, November 3rd through the 6th. 
um, and we would definitely love to have you have you come. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Kevin would would uh, definitely want you to come and see him uh, speak this year. Um, we are actually going. We're actually running a uh, a big promotion on our Facebook page right now. Um, you can enter to win two free passes for you, a friend, a colleague, or an employee, uh, to go ahead and come to the Medical Tourism Congress. The deadline is October 18th. So go over to our Facebook page, which would be www.facebook.com forward slash Medical Tourism Congress. Click on the two free passes tab, enter your details, and we'll make sure to uh, to uh, contact everyone directly after the, uh, the October 18th deadline. Because we'll be offering a few uh, uh, other uh, promotions to runners up. We're also making a really, really big effort this year in order to um, get social with you and, and let everyone who, who might not be able to, to attend the event this year uh, really see what it's about and see what we're going to be covering. So we're, we're, I'm actually going to be managing a live blog for the, for the Congress this year, and we're going to be covering a lot of the top sessions, uh, keynotes, uh, Dr. Kevin Poe's session, uh, actually, uh, the Ministerial Summit, the Medical Director's Summit, and we're going to have daily summaries. Um, I believe also we're going to have a couple of sponsors really share their, their opinion and, and, and what their experience is like uh, uh, attending and sponsoring the, uh, the event. Um, also, you'll, you'll be able to uh, join the conversation. Uh, we're going to be posting the, the full agenda uh, at, on the uh, Medical Tourism Congress Twitter page, uh, Twitter profile. And every, every moment, whatever session is going on at the, at the Medical Tourism Congress, you'll be able to uh, stay on top of it and, and know what's, what's happening right at that moment. Um, also, we'll be monitoring our MedTour account. So if you go ahead and mention at MedTour plus the hashtag MTCQA with any questions, um, whether you're attending or if, or, or if, you, if you have a co uh, question about how, how the event's going itself or you just want to chat with us, uh, feel free to send them in and we'll be able to uh, get back to you as soon as possible, uh, let you know where sessions are, uh, when, when exhibit hall hours are, etc. Um, also, if you're attending, uh, feel free to, to use the, uh, the hashtag MTC or MT Congress uh, hashtag on Twitter or Facebook, especially since Facebook just released their, the ability to, uh, to post hashtags. Let everyone know that you're at the conference or uh, if, if you're looking uh, and who you're looking to meet at the con Congress, uh, Congress this year. It will be a really great way to, to go beyond uh, just the networking platform. And maybe you can even gain some outside connections as well. Um, that and that will be basically it for today. I, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Kevin Poe again for uh, for joining us today. Um, it looks like we still have some time left, so if anyone has any questions for for uh, Kevin, you can go ahead and post them in the Q and A tab, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, address them. I had uh, uh, Carolina ask about um, building a repu reputation through, uh, for medical tourism facilitators. Uh, as you know, they're, they're basically the travel agents of our industry, and there's a lot of uh, fly-by-night facilitators that, have, that, have, uh, uh, that, that come in and out of the, of the uh, industry, but there's a lot that, that actually want to make a really big presence in the, in the industry and really do some good. Uh, what, would you, what would you recommend that they do in order to, to, to stand out from the rest right at, right, right to begin, right, or right at the beginning of their, uh, their fresh presence online? Well, I think that you can, uh, again, uh, share stories about what they do. Um, I think uh, starting a you know, blog and, uh, you know, I guess giving uh, exactly, um, you know, are there, are there uh, audience, are they towards patients or just kind of building their own online reputation as these uh, facilitators? Uh, the, a, a lot of facilitators are looking for uh, a lot are looking for patients online, of course, because that's really what runs their business. But I see I've seen a lot on um, on LinkedIn that are looking for business to business connections, looking to actually meet with the with the hospitals and 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 uh, and meet with uh, the CEOs or the marketing directors of hospitals in order to 
to create a plan in order to pass patients between each other or uh, and open up other business opportunities. Yeah, so I think the same rules apply in terms of you want you want a, a bigger online presence. You do need to participate in different platforms and make and just realize that patients or just people will consume information in, in, in different ways, whether it's telling a story through a blog or, or making videos. Um, I think videos are certainly underappreciated. Uh, YouTube's actually the world's second largest search engine, and a lot of us in healthcare underestimate the power of video. So I think that whatever content that you create, not only do you want a text version in a blog, but it will also be nice to have a video version on YouTube, and it will just be another channel where, where people that you want to connect with can consume that information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have another question here. Javier asked, um, is it a big mistake for, for the, the, like the C-suite of, of a hospital not to be involved in social media? Do you believe that, that they should be doing uh, uh, like VIP branding uh, for their C-suite and, and, and uh, to really push the, uh, the strength of the hospital out? I don't want to comment about a you know, C-suite strategy, but I think to the first question, is it a mistake for cease to, uh, for uh, you know the executives to ignore social media. Yes, I think it's a mistake to ignore social media because I think uh, social media are the most powerful tools that come along in a generation, and uh, you need complete buy-in from a medical institution from the CEO on down. One of the reasons that the Mayo Clinic is so successful with their social media strategy is because there's complete buy-in from the CEO, and it's built into their DNA. So social media certain, certainly should not be relegated just to the marketing department or the PR department, but it really should be part of everyone's jobs. I'm a physician, and obviously I'm speaking from a physician standpoint, and, and I certainly don't see this enough. But uh, in, in order for more of us to adopt social media, it needs to be part of our job requirement. I think that uh, instead of I mean, again, in the United States, there's a lot of pressure to, to, to see a certain number of patients, and I certainly believe that we can, we you know, we shouldn't, we should substitute some of those hours seeing patients by communicating with them on social media, and I think that's the only way that we can increase the adoption of social media. Um, it certainly shouldn't be ignored um, in any circumstance. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people in the C-suite, they ask me, you know, what the ROI of social media is. Over the past year or so, about 10 to 15 percent of my new patients found me solely because of my blog and what I do online. And I think a lot of hospitals are going to realize that they're going to be attracting more and more patients uh, through the web. And if you have a strong social media presence, um, that's only going to uh, better those efforts. In fact, there was a study from, uh, I think it was a polling firm called YouGov, and they polled uh, patients and they asked them, what are some of the factors that attracted you to certain hospitals? And about 80% of patients said that social, uh, that social media defined a hospital as being cutting edge, and 60% of patients said that social media was a factor in them choosing that hospital. So if you want to attract new patients, you need to be uh, active and have a strong presence on social media. Absolutely. Um, I have Joe here. He asked, um, he asked the, as, as, like the, as the chief marketing officer for a hospital, do you, do you believe that it's a, a good idea to, to actually push my, uh, the, his physicians to be a part of social media, or should you allow them to adopt it on their own terms? I think you need to show them the value, and then once they see the value, then they can adopt it at their own pace. So the biggest point that would resonate with doctors is patients Googling them online. And I think that you want to have a first step is just Googling their doctor's name at least once a week. The majority of doctors who don't have a social media presence, what's going to come up is going to be something from a physician rating site. And in some cases, it's going to be a bad review. And do you, you need to ask your doctors, do you want, is that how you want to be represented? Is that the first thing that you want patients to see when patients Google you online? And that point generally resonates with them the most. And if they say, I want to do something about it. Then you could introduce options. In turn, and my, my first option, of course, would be to you know, go on LinkedIn or start building your, your, your online presence proactively. I don't think that you could force social media on doctors. They need to realize on their own what the value is. And the most uh, uh, powerful point to, to get across that value would be um, just Googling their name. Absolutely. Sarah asks, um, she, she, 
she works for a, for a small uh, medical practice, and they were looking to, to hire a social media manager to get them started on social media. Do you believe it's a little, that, that there's a point where it's a, it's a little pr premature to hire a, a full-time employee to handle social media? And if so, is there a, is there a, what is the point when you believe that you should take on full-time staff to help manage um, your social media efforts? Well, I think that every organization, every practice, of course, they're going to have different uh, financial pictures. And if they have the resources to hire a social media manager, you know, by all means, I think that's only going to help increase their adoption. Ideally, uh, you want the content to come from, from the providers themselves. I think they need to be engaged at some point because that's going to uh, increase the authenticity of, of, of the social media encounter. If I'm a patient and I was engaging with a medical practice on social media, and I got to spoke get, get to, you know if I got if I got to speak with a provider uh, or engage with a provider directly versus a, a social media manager, I think that's going to be a much more powerful interaction, which is why I always say that social media should be ideally taught to the providers, and instead of 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 you know seeing patients, they could perhaps spend maybe an afternoon a week creating content on social media. And it doesn't have to be owners. You know, for doctors who aren't good writers, for instance, they don't have to write a blog post. They could just film a, a three-minute video on YouTube because what are we doing in the exam room? We're talking to patients. So if you just create a video and, uh, on, on some type of patient education or patient question and, and film a three-minute video and, and put it up on your site, I think that that's tremendously effective. I think that you want to get the faces and the voices of your providers out there. Um, and ideally you want the providers themselves to do it, but of course a social media manager can help facilitate that. Absolutely. And having, having employee introductions or, doctor, or physician in, uh, introductions on your site would definitely make it a more personable experience as well. Um, I've got one last question here, um, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and move forward. Um, Joe, Joe also asked, um, what, what do you believe is the most valid social media channels to focus on? Uh, he, he's been hearing a lot of uh, media buzz about, on, about Twitter and have, having a lot of fake accounts. And, and also, there was, uh, I believe, six months ago, uh, I, I read that there was, I think, maybe three million accounts deleted from Facebook uh, that turned out to be fake. Yeah. So um, I think I talked earlier that you want it depends on what your goals are. Um, I think if you're an individual doctor, LinkedIn, um, I think Twitter certainly has value. I, I'm on Twitter constantly, not so much to let people know what I'm doing, but it's really to listen to, to, to physician thought leaders and listen to what they have to say. A byproduct of that is that your Twitter profile will also um, get ranked when, when, when your name is Googled. Uh, Facebook, certainly, uh, it, it's important to have a presence if you want to reach a certain demographic. But I think another reason that I didn't talk about why it's important to get a presence there is that you don't want competitors or, or others faking your presence because I think that's a problem in other industries. Uh, competitors are, are, are kind of fraudulently creating accounts to, uh, to mimic their competitors. So if you claim your own presence and control that, I think that would just take that threat off the table. Um, so again, you want to define what your goals are on social media and um, you know, whether you want to listen or whether you want to, uh, again, engage with patients or educate them or find new patients or if you want to talk about healthcare policy and advocate for healthcare change. Each social media platform is going to have a different strength. So once you define what you want to, what you want to do first, then that's going to help you uh, determine um, how to proceed forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. And definitely the one-on-one the -on -one personal uh, engagement and really and, and make and humanizing yourself online because of, there's a lot of the competitors that that are just the robots, especially on twi on uh, Twitter. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you so much, Kevin, for uh, for for joining us today, and thank you for answering all of our questions. Um, everyone, he'll be he'll be at the conference this year. It's going to be a really really great session. I'm definitely looking forward to it. I believe I'm going to be the one that's actually vlogging his his uh, session. So. Um, Please uh, feel free to, to send me any emails if you have any further questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, we'll also be taking the, the conversation online to our LinkedIn groups. Um, and you can expect a, a uh, re replay of the, of the webcast within 24 to 48 hours after the team gets a chance to uh, edit the video. 
So again, thank you so much, Kevin. I uh, really appreciate it, and I hope you have a wonderful day, and I hope you, all of the listeners today had a, uh, will have a wonderful day and uh, rest of the week. Fantastic. Thanks for the opportunity, and uh, I'll see you all in Las Vegas. Absolutely. L looking forward to seeing you there. All right. Take care. Take care.